Hello and welcome to Newspeak, the New Culture Forum's weekly show about what is happening in the news. It's usually hosted by Emma Webb, as you know. Unfortunately, Emma is not very well this week, so you're landed with me, Peter Whittle, director, and indeed our senior fellow, Dr. Philip Kizzerly, who's uh, here with me from uh, Leeds University. Um, obviously, the first thing, Philip, you've just travelled all the way down from Leeds. Um, what was it like? Because, th- th- frankly, w- the whole news is dominated at the moment by the rail strike. Yeah, uh, it was it was fine. I yeah. was I was thinking it's going to take forever, uh, and I stepped right on the train. Uh, it was it was easy to get a seat, and uh, I even had a sandwich. It was it was perfectly okay. Yeah. Um, but as I, as I was uh, travelling down, I was reading uh, about the the rail strike and and just where we are with it, and it is going to be absolute chaos. But what's your, what do you feel about the strike? I've got. Are I mean, you, I, you know, supporting them? Well, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I've got I've got really mixed feelings about it. On the one hand, people should be allowed to indulge in industrial action and and, and strike and and think about their pay. But this yeah. isn't really about that. I don't think they're on. I think six percent, uh, an offer of six percent, which is twice as much as nurses are getting, for mm-hmm. example, and, and you know, academics who've just been striking as well, I know, would give a kidney for six percent, you yeah. know. Um, but it's not, it's actually not really about that. I don't know how much you know about it, and, and, and viewers will probably know quite a lot, but it's the, the conditions is, is the really interesting thing. Um, so I was, I was just, re- I was just reading about it, and there was something about Spanish conditions, and I thought, what the hell's that? And I thought, I, d- I, d- I don't want a Spanish practice, I should say. Yeah, it's like and problem. I thought, shall I, shall I Google this in a public place, or you know, is, is it going to be, uh, is it going to be controversial? Um, and Tractors, you know, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's, it's nothing to do with me. Um, but it, the conditions are really interesting. So they, they get paid extra for for going to the toilet. Um, maybe I've got that wrong. I didn't quite understand it, but as I read it, that's what it seemed to be. They, they're, they're striking about, so if a, if, if a manager interrupts their break, yeah, yeah. says anything to them, yeah. they get to start their break again. So this isn't really about the cost of living. It's, 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 it's about power. Um, and, and Mick Lynch, as, as you see in the, uh, in the media is uh, I, I can't help but think about Arthur Scargill. He's Arthur Scargill without a coma. Well, he's actually made an appearance, hasn't he? And Arthur Scargill's made an appearance yeah. at, at Wakefield, yes. I think. Yeah. So he was he was part of the he, he was part of the picket line there. But he, everything about him, the, the 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 way he conducts himself, the way he comports himself, there's, there's a sense that he's 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 taking on the mm-hmm. government and and the, this mobilisation of this class war narrative again i think really really don't go there because people will turn that on and off like a tap people will just use it okay we know that because we know what people think about working class brexit voters you know the left will just will just use that um but there there was a sense that he's he's trying to mobilize everybody it's not just the 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 rail workers it's all the public sector because he wants glory and he wants to take on the government the thing is you see it's I'm sort of, I find myself being torn about this. I mean, well, I, well this is why I say I've got mixed feelings about yeah, it. I mean, I, yes. I totally understand them wanting more money, but it's when you, when you look beneath the surface, you see other things happening. What it is, though, what I find extraordinary about this is that when I saw Kay, Kay Burley, yeah. this guy talking to a union leader, and I mean, basically, there is this outrage at you know, the fact that people are going to be so inconvenienced. So, yes, of course, I understand that's that. That's what happens but with the, industrial action. There is, that's the point of a strike. Mm. I, it's, it's almost like, how can you do this? I, I, I mean, that's the only thing that somehow sort of just slightly makes me feel on, on the fan, fence mm. about it. I'm mm. sure it will go mm. by the end, you know, by next week or whatever. But um, I just sort of feel that there is this sort of sense in which people who are incredibly liberal on moral things mm, and mm. social and cultural things suddenly become really hard line on these things. Mm, it's, mm. it's very, and young people, interestingly, have no, many of the ones I spoke to have no truck with it at all. Mm, you know? mm. uh, and yet it's sort of somehow, you know, it's, just, you know, it's, 
It's extraordinary, really. But I suppose the thing really that I found about it was that it spawned these various articles saying, are we going back to the 70s? Now, I know that's an area that you particularly are interested in, yeah. or the early 70s, yeah. is that right? Yeah, well, the, the 60s and 70s in my and kind 70s. of research area was cultural history. And, it? you know, I was a teenager in the 70s, mm. and I'm just wondering how, you know, basically how similar is it to then? Uh, in other words, have we picked up where we left off, if you like, after Thatcher? Yeah. Or not? I, I, I looked at the news today uh, and we're on, what, is it 9.1% inflation rate now? Mm. And, and I actually tweeted this and I thought, oh, well, we're, we're heading straight back to the winter of discontent. Yeah. And I know that's the end of the 70s, but everything's in place. There's a sense of emerge. We had national emergencies at the beginning of the, the 70s. We had an oil crisis in 1973. We had political turmoil. OK, we've not had national emergencies, but we've, we've not been far off in, in lots of ways. We're just out of COVID. Um, inflation's through the roof. Um, there's political turmoil. There's cultural turmoil as well. All of these ingredients are, are, are poured in there. Um, the, I, I suppose the thing that worries me is this idea that everybody's jumping on the bandwagon and if the uh, RMT, the, 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 the rail workers can get the teachers to strike, can get the you know, um, NHS to strike, can get all of the public sector to strike, that's going to be catastrophic mm. for us because inflation really is going to go through the roof then and we are going to see real poverty of a kind we've not seen and we're not prepared for because we've never experienced it really since since the early 70s. But the, uh, even lawyers are saying about going on strike or something? I mean, that would be no great loss, <laughs> will it, lawyers? I, mean, I think there are two words put together <laughs> which are the worst in the English language at the moment for me, and it's activist and lawyer, yeah. um, especially if they're, if they're European. But yeah, lawyers going on strike, yes, really? something like something like this. I think the thing is, you see, is I remember in the 70s, um, people say, well, how is it, you know, it's very much the same. We've just had a jubilee, for example, yeah, yeah. Um, and yet the country feels like it's falling apart um, and, and, and all of that. But I think you see that we were, the difference is this, there was this huge argument going on in the 70s. Should the future be socialist or capitalist? That argument was apparently won, mm. right? It, was, it became a cliche, you know, the right won the economic arguments, mm. the left still hold on to the cultural argument. But um, that was going on, but as a society, we were culturally quite intact. Mm. Strange as it may seem. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, there was much more of a sense of we. Mm. It's I the think. thing that Roger Scruton talks about, yes. isn't it? Is that, that idea of the national we, yes. the, the, yes. the collective. And I mean, I don't want to start being rose-tinted about it because I remember, I'm sure a lot of our viewers will actually, you know, there was a lot about the 70s, it was very dreary. Um, I mean, you know, as, as a, a cultural historian, what, what is your interest? I mean, presumably it's in the artifacts of the time. It's, it's in the books and the films and, and indeed the clothes. I mean, here you are, you're wearing and mohair. Indeed, the clothes, yeah. I'm, I'm, wearing, <laughs> I'm wearing mohair on the hottest day of the year, but I'm survive if I, if, I, if I melt onto the floor, you know, you'll just have to yeah. take it yourself. But where did it come from then? Because you would, you would have been a child. I mean, I, I, I was. I, I, it's, it's the dawn of my memory. I was born in 1971. I think just, just before we get to that, can we, can we just put that other point to bed? And because there's something that you've, you've just reminded me of. And, and if we're thinking about industrial action now um it doesn't just stop if the if the, the the strikes happen and on on a large scale they don't just go away because i'm thinking about the the miners strike of of, of 1984 1985 that was i suppose ostensibly about the industrialization wasn't it and and the uh, the the the, the the, the narrowing down or the, or the stopping of, of heavy industry uh, because we were moving into a post-industrial economy. But it was, also, it was also payback for the 70s, wasn't it? It was unfinished business, for the, 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 the dockers, the miners, all of that stuff in the early 70s. So it was, it, Scargill was a 70s figure, really. Uh, and, and, and Margaret Thatcher 
put him in his place. You know, it was it was finishing up. It was unfinished business. So my fear now is that this is going to go on. The ramifications of this are going to go on for years and years and years, and, and we'll feel you know we'll we'll feel it. Um, and and most importantly, the most vulnerable people economically, the most vulnerable people in society will will, will feel it. Yeah, I think uh, the difference maybe in the seventies. Um, the trade union movement was part of the government. Mm. You know, you were super aware of them. Mm. I would have to think before naming the head of the TUC now. Yeah. But back in the 1970s, all of the big figures were known. Yeah. They were always being invited to Downing Street for beer and sandwiches, as it was called. And they were on chat shows. And yeah. I, I remember, I can't remember the, his name now, Jimmy. He was on. Jimmy Reed? I uh, was on Parkinson, yeah. wasn't yeah. he? With, you Kenneth know, with Kenneth Williams. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, famously went head to head with mm. Kenneth mm. Williams. So, yeah. yeah, I suppose that is a difference. And, uh, but, but it was, uh, that was seen to by Thatcher uh, completely. Um, I suppose when I say that I'm torn, I don't mean, oh, you know, they've got a point. I don't, I think, because basically I feel that the unions have lost their power, not just because of Thatcher, but actually because they have failed to do the two or three things they're meant to do for their members, mm. i.e. protect their jobs. Mm. How can you take them seriously when they have positively encouraged and celebrated mass migration, mm, mm, mm. which has driven down mm. wages yeah, of people. Yeah. Not a peep, mm. not a peep from them. So it's very hard to take them seriously in that way. But I think the broader thing, it seems to me, is actually this whole uh, argument about automation and, and basically driverless trains. And, and you know that's where I start to be a little bit shaky because I sort of think, well, what are, you, what are people gonna do? People mm. have to work. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, I've had arguments with Tories and they say, you know, uh, oh, that's of course, we, you know, you don't need these people. They're just put on a switch and then that's it. You know? I sort of think, and they get 60,000. And I sort of think, well, it's so good. Why didn't you do it? Mm -hmm. You know, I've had that <laughs> argument. I'm sorry, it sounds juvenile. But no. I sort of think, what is going to happen to people? They need to work. People need, we all need to work. We, again, but this, this has been a, a, a conversation, a talking point forever hasn't it you know whenever there are whenever there's techni technologically driven change so there's always that question is, well, what are people going to do you yeah. know i remember uh, being in supermarkets a few years ago when you're when you're, you're you're doing your own checkout stuff you know not only are you paying for a fortune you're paying a fortune for it you're actually working for them as well you know yeah. you're doing their job and i'm thinking to myself no i'll i'll go to to, to have someone check out for me because that's their job and that's what they want to do. Yeah. So I think in, in, in some ways we can vote with our feet and we can, we can if, if we want a service, we can make sure that people provide the service. But by the same token, you can't, you know, things change and, and things well, move yeah, on, I mean, don't they? Do, they? Yes, but they do change, but why should they? I mean, as far as it's the classic, it's the classic no, conservative why, point, isn't no, it? No, but why should I mean, like, take buses, right? It was a mistake to get rid of bus conductors. Yeah. Now you've got this guy on his own behind glass, or this mm. woman, and basically having to keep an eye on, basically keeping out the way most mm. of the time. Mm. Um, but the, just a human presence. So another person's got a job, and they basically it is a social role that they've got actually it, but you're talking about the same thing that i'm talking about you're talking about service and you're talking mm -hmm. about personal interaction mm -hmm. um if it's about being competitive if it's about if it's about using technology technology wisely and being able to kind of like i say compete with other countries then yeah. i think you've got to think again about that yes yeah i i think all i would say is i think that there are other things you know, when we talk about the 70s, you know, you have this, for example, uh, this sense in which things that don't work mm. anymore, mm. you know, um, whether it's at the airports mm. and all the things going on there and everything. And that sort of sense in which there's a kind of, things are breaking mm. up slightly. Mm. Um, and I, that does sort of strike me, but what do you think were the upside of the 70s? I mean, of the 70s. There is a name, would it be right to say you're, you're nostalgic for a period that you didn't know? I mean, there is actually a name for that, I think. Yes, there is, and I can't remember what it but is it, now. But you should know that you're a cultural historian. But, but basically, there is actually a name 
when people are nostalgic for something they couldn't have known. But I did know it. I think it's the it's the the dawn of of, of my realization, and, and and I think that um, I was I was born in 1971, so certainly towards the end of the decade, I was I was aware of of what's going on, and in in my um, in my kind of subconscious recollection, or not even subconscious, I can remember it. I can remember the lights going out. I can remember candles. Um, I can remember being poor. We were we were poor for, for a, a, a major part of that. We were, a, a, you know, a one parent family, um, and and there were there were no food banks, you know. So I I remember some of that vividly. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily nostalgia, uh, and I certainly wouldn't say it's 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 rose tinted. What I would say is, for me, it's a it's a reference point, mm. and. And it, and it feels as though the further we're going on into the 20th century, the more important that reference point of the 70s is. Because people didn't really used to talk about the 70s that much. Everybody talked about the yeah. 60s because yeah, that yeah. was the time of innovation and change, certainly cultural innovation and change, not, not, not all of it good by any means, but it was the time of change. Now we've got this, or we, haven't we, we're feeling as though you know, what do we do? Where do we go um, w with a government that doesn't seem to care, with a with a with a, an opposition that's completely useless, um, with people who who don't even know what gender they are? You know, where are we going? What's happening? Conditions were different in the 70s, but there's a lot of similarity there. Things were beginning to disintegrate. Things were beginning to fall apart. The the the, the radicalness of the of the 60s had, had turned sour. Uh, in the 70s, and, and we were, and we were seeing, you know, the, the the results of it. And I think there's 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 a similarity between the, you know, the the radical Marxism and anarchists of the 1970s and and the woke identitarian, you know, culture warriors now. Yes, I mean, you're you're in the thick of it, aren't you? Really, I mean, yeah. being in academia, but I do know that you love a lot of the television from that mm. time, mm. and that was a golden. Era, wasn't mm. it? I mean, I'm sorry to you know get too nostalgic, <laughs> but I mean you're often watching the Sweeney and some of these other uh, uh, series that have pretty much gone into the mists of time, like mm. Hazel mm. and was it uh, Budgie? Yeah, I remember with Adam mm. Face, and I remember my mum loving all of these because they were you know they were working people. They were working on people. screen. They were working you know? people. That that was that was one of the things where you know we we did champion working class people not only that actually we championed working class white men as well and that was mm. the last time yeah, we, yeah. We, we did that so by the beginning of the 1980s shows which were which were massively popular you've, you've just talked about detective shows the sweeney and hazel and all of that kind of thing it's all working working class white guys so by the turn of the 1980s it was juliet bravo the chinese detective all different you know which was about ethnicity which was about being female completely different yeah. thing it's the mm. beginning of identity politics actually mm. but one of the, the one of the things about the 1970s television coming of age i think is that it goes out of the studio it's not it's not studio bound it's actually in the streets mm. so what you get on on the shows that we've just talked about is this very mobile um, entertainment that actually is a kind of documentary of the mm. time and we see what's going on so I think for me as a historian one of the valuable things there about television in the 70s is that it's it's a document. You see it in a way that you didn't really see it in the sixties. You saw a lot no. of it, the insides yeah. of studios, but you didn't see you didn't see the streets in the same way. So I think there's something very immediate about that seventies entertainment, which which fascinates me. I think actually there was a clip. I think you once showed me. It might have been Hazel. But he's walking through Soho. He's walking through Soho, and yeah. And it would have been, what, 71, 2, something No, it's like later. It's, it's towards the end. It's about 77, 78. 77. Yeah. But it's an absolute piece of, you know, historical footage, even though Cinema it's Cinema verite, fiction. you know, it's, yes. it's, it's there. He's, he's, he's walking around looking for, looking for a client, but he's walking through Soho. And, and, it's, and it's seedy, mm. and, and, it, and it's mm. dirty, and it's gritty, and it's realistic. And it's fantastic, you know. So I think there's something 
I mean, viewers will will, will probably kind of chime in here with with with, with comments, but we I think we've lost something. It's an obvious thing to say, isn't it, with everything you've just said about immigration and, and the, the nature of changing things. But we've lost something of our identity, and I suppose that was the last vestige of our identity. And not only that, it was the last vestige of our identity, and it was in glorious Technicolor. Yes. You know, so yeah. that's the decade, I suppose, the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s. It's a cliche, I know, but we see it in colour. It's much more immediate. Before then, it's black and white, and it's, and it's much, much farther removed. Mm. Well, I mean, cul culture then, is, well, wasn't such a battlefield. Um, moving on to another topic, something that's happened this week, um, which, you know, is pretty much the kind of thing we've talked about a lot, is that a particular artist... Uh, William Kendridge, uh, who's actually got a show coming up at the Royal Academy, um, has just said that we should bury uh, up to the shoulders some of our great historical statues, not least of which he mentions Churchill, um, so that we can look down on them. That they're not actually going to be got rid of, but we should look down on them what, because that's what we should be doing. What, what was your initial response to that? Well, I just sort of thought, well, actually, I got very, very angry. I mean, as, as you do, uh, as I increasingly do when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> but I just sort of thought, you know, this just to me sums up, you know, this kind of mediocre attack yeah. on, on greatness and on excellence. Mm. You know, I don't know this guy's work. Uh, he's critically praised for all I know, but in a way it's not the point. It's sort of almost, it's how dare you, you know, who are you? Mm. Do you not feel that? I mm. mean, who who are you to actually say such ridiculous and actually disrespectful things? And also it makes me realise as well um, what the kind of bubble is that they live in. You know, because maybe they're surrounded by people who think, yeah, great idea, William, you know. But I mean, I can't think of anyone who would think that that's anything other than just outrageous. I, I can't think of a worse idea. One of the things that um, struck me was, my God, this guy must be a real narcissist. Yeah. You know? Yes. And it, and it was that aspect of the culture, that aspect of the culture, which I, I really can't stand, um, that piggybacking on, mm. on somebody else's glory, using somebody else's glory to, to shine a light mm. on someone, as, as, as you say, who's completely mediocre. But for me, it was slightly more than that. It was alarming in the sense that, you know, it, it's almost like if you, if you did a psychiatrist's couch with this guy, you think, what, you want to do that to historical figures? You want to look down on historical figures? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know? I, be careful, you know, it's yeah. Yeah. psychopathic. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a ridiculous thing to do. But the thing is, what I feel about this is it, the way in which it's not receding. It, you know, this attack, you know, in whatever form it takes, and would he be considered part of a metropolitan elite? I suppose so. It's just, it's kind of continuing. It's just being chipped, chipping away and chipping away. And you sort of therefore feel, I sort of feel in a way, that you have to be on your guard all yeah. the time. Yeah. You know, to preserve these things. The, I, the other thing that, that, that I think, and, and I think we've, we've made this point before, but I think it's worth making again, actually. It's, it's so easy to do this kind of crap, isn't it? Because I'm sure this person, as you've just said, is, is, is in a bubble with like-minded people. And this will be framed, you know, I, I mean, I can see it now. This is going to be framed as edgy and daring and stunning and brave and all of that kind of thing. And it's just it, it's just speaking in an echo chamber mm. to people who think exactly the same to the and attacking the easiest targets. Um, I, again, we've said this before, but you know there are other targets to attack which which by god will bite back oh yes you know yes. finally because we're, we're doing a quite a short one this week but um i was very amused by <laughs> this story it actually came out today it was in the times but i think it's been in all the other newspapers as well that apparently london not britain london has the noisiest restaurants uh, bar any other city except for San Francisco. San Francisco. You've seen this, right? Yeah. And now some guy has gone along and actually done a kind of random survey using a deci what is it, a deci decibel meter or whatever, 
Um, but apparently it is a danger, a kind of danger level. It's, it's the sort of thing that makes, causes pain to people who've got loss of hearing yeah. and things. Yeah. Why is the big question that's hanging over this? What is it? And if you look at all the comments in the, in the Times, for example, it's saying, oh, it's because of these big cavernous industrial type restaurants that don't have carpets. And that's possibly true. You know, don't have carpets, don't have soft furnishings. But I think it's more than that. I think it's just that people don't give a damn anymore. I think it's people that listen to each other as well. Yeah. So it's just people talking yeah. at each other. I mean, do you still? Go, I mean, do you, it, does it put you off? It puts me off. I have to go in, and I, and I say, well, actually, wait a minute. There's a there's a group of dare I say this? There's a group of like, say maybe six women in their thirties, and I sort of think, <laughs> oh, actually no, can we in fact can, you know go as far away as possible? But I I find that it's because people it's a kind of competitive laughter goes on. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, w w just to, to link back to what we were talking about before about working conditions and, and, and the, the, the rail uh, workers striking because they don't get paid to go to the toilet or whatever it is. Maybe I've got that wrong. But um, what about the poor people who are working in these places? No. Who are, who are, who are yeah, subject the waiters, to... Yeah, the waiters. No, but apparently one of the points f put forward is that in fact it's because they, it's for their benefit. Because when you ask them to turn it down, you often get kind of vague coolness or hostility. Right. I, I've sort of had that. It's yeah. almost like they don't want to do it because it kind of makes them feel that they're working in a nightclub or something like that. Oh, okay. But I mean, to me, it's like one of the problems of modern manners. Well, I, actually, one of, one of the other things that, because uh, I, I, I saw the story and it gave a list of the loudest restaurants and the names look really really awful and it gave a list of the quietest restaurants and they look fabulous you know what i mean so you'd want to you want to go to the quiet restaurants because they were obviously so much more classy weren't yes, they? you know yes. so you know you look at those loud restaurants and you go yeah those are the people i want yeah. to avoid those you know there's a and I, I i don't want to kind of castigate kind of liberals oh, oh i will do okay yes. well, you're uh, in the right place i'm in the right I mean. place to do it. but there's this kind of the way that I, I, I call it the Joe Brand yes. way of talking, where they've got this very deep, you know low kind of talking like this, and it absolutely fills the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I see you know someone dressed in in black linen uh, waving the Guardian around, I, I you know no way am I going to eat yeah. in that. You know no way am I. I hope you don't that. go to those places anyway. <laughs> I mean, uh, but uh, anyway, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you have various particular bugbears. I mean, mine are a list long. Uh, a long list, should I say, about modern life. But um, by the way, before we actually uh, uh, sign off, um, we've just had one of our new heresies out. I don't know, Philip made one, a great one, um, about history and um, the war on our history. It was called, the war on our history, yeah. please do watch it. Do watch yeah. it, very, very good. And uh, we've just got a new one out actually this week with Michael Collins. Uh, Michael Collins wrote a book called The, the Likes of Us, you know, the, likes yeah. of us the Biography yeah. of the White Working Class. It's all about how Labour now despises mm. uh, the working class. So that's just come out. So do look that up. Um, thanks very much for coming Thank down. For it. It's great yeah. to see you as, as usual. And, um, and we will see you next week on Newspeak. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, May I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as £3 per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.